Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Bench Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Rox Rafi, and as always, joined by David and Theodore. We have a great episode coming up right now. We're going to hear Theodore talk a little, a lot, a little bit about the Giants, a little bit, maybe maybe a couple seconds about the Giants, something too crazy. But boys, I want to know how you guys are doing first before we get into, unfortunately, how two of our teams played was not great, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Boys, how are we doing today? Football, or at, at least professional football is back, so yeah. I'm still tired from Sunday. That's all I can say. Uh, we'll talk about the Patriots later. Uh, tired? I don't know what that is. All I know is the feeling of victory when Saquon Barkley is back. Man, I can't even formulate words. I'm so excited. I'm sorry. But, um, yeah, I, I'm happy right now. Um, I haven't felt this in a long time. So having a winning record really just completely has changed my life. Absolutely. This is Fedor's Super Bowl. We decided we thought he'd descend into madness, but he has just gone straight into delusion first. He'll be soon heading into, I believe, the se- it's seven stages of grief. So he will be seeing those throughout the rest of the season. I'm sorry, Fedor, but what stage I, of grief get- is winning the Super Bowl again, Rafi? What? <laughs> what stage? He's saying of grief the Giants are going to win the winning- Super. You no. you wouldn't know because you're a Falcons fan, but like you get the idea. Yeah. Okay. Anyways, I do want to talk about the NFC East, and specifically one NFC East team. Dak Prescott injured his thumb. I believe it was a swinging motion that went onto the helmet. He's going to be out. I believe it said six weeks was the report. Not good for the Cowboys. Cooper Rush is going to be a starting quarterback. If you guys watched him prior and past seasons, fill in for Dak Prescott. His last name's Rush for a reason, because it certainly wasn't passed, because that would be very ironic. Boys, is this kind of a nail in the coffin on the Cowboys season already as much as I am very excited for my Giants and as much as I want to trash on the Cowboys no it is not because I I watched most of the full week of football you know going through red zone on the one o'clock games I saw the NFC teams let me just say there are a lot of underwhelming teams and quite frankly I think 8-9, and 9-8 nine, nine and eight will absolutely be in the running for a wild card. So the Cowboys really just need to tread water for now until Dak gets back. Like, if they're 3-5 and five when Dak Prescott comes back, they're still right in the playoff game. And they I have one of the easiest schedules in the NFL, so see, as much as I want to say it, we can't close the book on them yet. Their next six is for Cincinnati, the Giants, which, depending on who you're talking to, that might be a... A, a bit of a stretch to say the Cowboys. We're not losing to Cooper Rush, I'm sorry. Then you have the Commies, then you have the Rams, Eagles, and then Dak either returns or the Lions week seven or the Da Bears, sorry, Da Bears week eight. Davian, what are your thoughts on the Cowboys situation? Um, I, I don't, just don't, I mean, I wouldn't say their, their season's like completely over, but I don't see them really like, I could see them as like a wild card team at best. Um, Look, they didn't even look good when Dak Prescott was playing. Now you can right. argue that was my problem. Yeah, you could say that the Buccaneers' defense is great, but we really don't know. I mean, yeah, it's only been one week, but they just Dak Prescott didn't look good. I also don't get what the Cowboys are doing. Feed the man, feed the ball to Ezekiel Elliott. I'm sorry, You're the guy had so a funny. He had ten rushes for about fifty-seven yards in the first half, and then. Done. They like stopped giving the ball. They were like switched to Tony Pollard. Tony Pollard is great. Don't get me wrong. He could be a starting running back in other for other teams for sure. But I don't get why you just stop feeding the ball to Zeke. Uh, it doesn't make sense. You're paying him the money, so use him or just trade him. And I see them trading him to like maybe even the 49ers. But what value are you are you gonna get for that? We've mentioned. This uh, before. you get Jimmy G okay. and like a second round and a, like a seventh rounder is that good value though for Ezekiel Elliott who right now I mean the Niners do need a running back with Elijah Mitchell going down and I believe he's gonna miss some time as well I think it's like also like around six weeks that he's gonna be missing so he's gonna be out for a while so I guess the trade makes sense from a fantasy perspective. it doesn't make much sense though from a real life perspective especially because I think it does you'd have to think the Cowboys would have to retain money on a Zeke trade and then there's also We've seen time and time again, I've talked about this numerous times, where draft picks are much more valuable than players, regardless of, unless you are Russell Wilson or, like, an elite-level player, you're going to get traded for 
basically pennies on the dollar. You're not going to get traded for much as a whole. Because it makes sense that you value younger players, but like a third-round pick, which is a magic beans, it's a lottery ticket for a potential player. who, And the hit rate's not very good for third-round picks regardless. Right. Versus a proven starter, starting caliber player, I don't get it. Unless it's quarterback. For some reason, like Carson Wentz is getting traded for seconds and thirds. I don't get that, but I mean, anyways. You could yeah. talk about also how the 49ers might need Jimmy G, which is a whole different conversation. See, I don't want to I don't want to say anything yet just because if we look at the conditions, that was a terrible though that was probably the worst conditions you would want for your rookie quarterback here lens, especially your facilities in San Francisco. It's nice to hold. Like obviously you can't really simulate what the games are going to be like. But you guys saw what it looked like in Chicago. It was off that's those aren't good conditions for no, no, it's that's not. football weather right there. No, it's, right. it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, slide. it's it's straight up ground and pound. You're not gonna yeah trade you're not gonna see Trey Lance really do much to be able to make you confident in him as a starter. So I'm gonna give it a I'll give him a week or two but before I make any opinion on that. Another thing I want to talk about, speaking about quarterbacks, Lamar Jackson set a deadline. Also important to note that he represents himself, which is great. We'd love to see players do that especially because you don't have to pay cut to the agent and it's just more power to the player which is very important that we definitely encourage here on the podcast but Lamar Jackson said week one is the deadline obviously that can change over the coming weeks if there's an offer that cannot be refused by Lamar Jackson but I want to hear your guys thoughts because in theory Lamar Jackson could play on the franchise tag the next two years and then just walk so I want to hear his thoughts because we know the Ravens are for the most part, a very cheap team, or they don't like to pay too much money for their players. My thoughts on the Lamar Jackson situation are very simple. Um, if I'm Lamar in this scenario right now, there is zero chance I am playing right now. Like, I'm sorry, I would straight up be holding out if I was Lamar. Just look at the track record of quarterbacks recently who have made the decision to hold out. It is... Like, okay, there's just no way that if Lamar decides that I'm not going to play football, there's no way he doesn't get paid. Like, some QB needy team will be out there, and they'll give him, you know, his, what was it, six years, um, 300 million or whatever. So probably something in that range is what he's looking for. I just think that he abs- – that all he can do by playing right now is getting injured and – ruin the potential payday he But I do want to mention real quick before I throw it over to you, Davian, that Dak Prescott had that really bad injury. I forgot how long. I, it may have taken him out for the whole season, but it took mm-hmm. him out for a while. And he still wound up getting paid. So right. if you look at this from the Ravens perspective, like their hands are kind of tied behind their back. They don't really have it. You either pay the man or your franchise is going to miss the playoffs. You don't well, really I, would, I, right. I believe I said this back in um, February when we were talking about it. If I was the Ravens, I would have traded Lamar Jackson in the offseason. I would have thrown in a system guy like Tyler Huntley. That's just my opinion. Oh, you know, do that, get a huge haul of assets, and, you know, don't screw up your finances forever. But um, whatever, Lamar's in a position, and most QBs are in this position, where you can do whatever you want and still get paid. I think Deshaun Watson is proof of that. If he can get paid, everyone can. Davian, any thoughts before we continue on? Yeah, I mean, I think Lamar is um, – you know, Lamar deserves the money for sure. Uh, he's played – he's played to to the caliber of getting the, the money that, like, you know, $300 million, whatever he's asking for. Um, I just don't see really the Ravens giving it. Uh, Theodore, I hate your theory and logic when it comes to, like, oh, you know, you don't need to Q- pay QB crazy money. With Lamar Jackson, I kind of see it. Um, you know, the way he plays is very injury-prone. Uh, just to... but it's very injury prone. But how many times does he actually miss like a substantial amount? Of that's time? true. That's true. I that's mean, the, time... I, I was on the same boat. I had the same belief for a while. Like, oh, like this is too risky. This is that. But then I finally, like, I think it was the Pat McAfee show or something mentioned that again, and it like hit me in the face. And I was like, wait, when was the last time Lamar Jackson? Like, obviously he was a little dinged up last year. He missed he was iffy. Yeah. But then again, the whole Ravens were injured, so you can't really even like say anything. But it's not like Lamar Jackson is playing risky because you can still be Lamar Jackson, and if anything, it's even be- he's even better now because he's elusive and aware 
that right, right. let me not put myself in a scenario where I'm diving headfirst with three linebackers about to. That's true. Uh, the one thing, like, I mean, I would say that um, I was going to, I was going to, would compare him to somebody else, but I completely forget. Um, but yeah, no, I see how system QB could work, as Theodore said. Uh, somebody like uh, Tyler Huntley. Tyler Huntley. Or even Gino's, any kind of I mean, Jimmy James. Look, look what the Seahawks are doing right now. Right. I mean, Geno Smith has been balling. I mean, uh, what they said on the, on the, sh- I don't know why they said this, but they said that Pete Carroll is looking for somebody who is a system QB, and now he gets a system QB in Geno Smith, and that's something that uh, he didn't really want in Russell. That Russell Wilson didn't want to accept. He didn't. He wants to play his own way. Um, but I mean, you know, there's there's the benefits and doubts for both. I mean, Lamar Jackson, uh, I, Rafi, as you said, I think the one time he actually missed the game, or like I remember the, the only time I ever imagined him missing like a, a half was yeah. when he needs to go take a poop, and it was against the Browns. I don't know if you guys remember that. But how uh, many times yeah. did Lamar Jackson not? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, but other than that, I mean, really, it's all rumors. I think he resigns. Um, there's bigger things to cover, really, I feel like. I think that no team would really want to trade the bang in the buck for him, um, really, because there's just, like, there's college kids that are gonna be coming out soon that are pretty good. Uh, there's QBs. They're not Lamar out. though. What? They're yeah, not but... Lamar though. Lamar is truly, in my eyes, an elite quarterback. But you guys are missing the bigger point. What I'm trying to say is that, like, just okay, just take a look at the past Super Bowl champions. Which right. one of those teams won a Super Bowl with any QB on any kind of large contract? The answer is none. No. Mahomes? No, the Mahomes, Rams? Not a, oh, yeah. Mahomes was right before. Yes. So you're, I understand the point you're making, though. The overall point that's very important, which is not kind of what you're going at, but I wanted to mention it, is when you draft a quarterback and you find out that he's a superstar after the first year, you have a four-year window to win mm-hmm. a championship. Yes. That is your window. Because once the quarterback's payday is, obviously, like you saw the Chiefs were paying Mahomes a ton, and you can – but the cap, there is – an absolute crunch once you have to start to pay a quarterback. So yes. I kind of took it a different way, but... Perfect example is the Chargers right now. Look at all the moves they made in the offseason. They did so much to set themselves up to win. Angles as well. Yeah. But, then in, but then in two years when I can't even begin to fathom what uh, Herbert's contract will be, but in two years when that kicks in, the team will be completely shredded. All of these pieces are going to be gone, and... The Chargers are going to have so many tough decisions to make. Obviously, this is assuming that they bring him back, which I think is safe to say at this point. Right. But obviously, I think the overall theme of this, though, is would you rather have Daniel Jones or Justin Herbert? And I think we clearly want Daniel Jones. because he's causing Exactly. Him. This guy gets it. Moving on, I want to talk real quick about a, our teams that have exceeded expectations and a team that has underwhelmed so far. Once again, it's week one, so... Obviously, the Packers are a prime example. Last year, week one, they got absolutely flabbergasted by the Saints in Jacksonville and made it all the way to the NFC Divisional, not the NFC Championship. So, week one, not too intuitive about how a team season is going to go, but just a team that we felt that could be better and a team that exceeded expectations. My team that underwhelmed was the Broncos. I think we all can agree that Monday Night Football was very disappointing. Obviously, you have the two fumbles. Very close to scoring touchdowns both those times, but it's like you you still shouldn't have been put in a scenario where I mean fourth and five too, and you're paying Russell Wilson so much money and you decide to kick a long field goal. I don't get that as well. I know the Broncos could be better in the next few weeks as Russell Wilson gets more accustomed to the offense. Hackett keeps working on his head coaching, but definitely wasn't concerned. Team that exceeded expectations. I know this is gonna sound crazy, but. You lose Tyree Kill. You expect the Chiefs to take a step back, and they, Theodore, you're, you must have loved this, but the Chiefs yes, have I did. demolished Kyler Murray. No amount of Kyler Murray study hours could have prepared them for how <laughs> badly the Chiefs smacked them that game, and it just shows that the Chiefs are still dogs in the AFC. They are. All right. So for my pick, I'm gonna go with. Um... You know, I don't know to go. With. I'd say the Packers because they disappointed. But oh wait, I said that they disappoint. Uh, same thing with the Cardinals. I said that they would disappoint. Same thing with the Denver Broncos. I mean, now, not to say that I'm some kind of expert analyst here, but um, 
<laughs> stats do speak for themselves. Just ignore my college football picks right now in this conversation. So that's a different story. But uh, my pick for disappointing teams, I have two. First of all, the Saints. Yes, they did get it together, but um, that was a really rough beginning. They, the Falcons got like five sacks on them in the first half. Mm-hmm. That is, I don't even remember the last time the Falcons had like two sacks in a game. I don't. Yeah. I think they had like eighteen sacks last season. They were terrible. So yeah. Because I'm not really worried about the whole Jameis thing. I think he'll be fine. He just needs some time to settle in. Same with Michael Thomas. We saw him break out late in the game. Kamara will settle in, but the line just seems like a really big problem. My other key team is going to be the Colts. They, um, I was very high on them, as I stated multiple times. Um, Matt Ryan did not look like the Matt Ryan I thought he'd look like. Um, he arguably got outplayed by Davis Mills, which is never a great thing, even though Mills... Might be a decent quarterback. But um, I don't know. Something about the Colts felt off. And the fact that they couldn't close it out in overtime really is a red flag for me. Absolutely. Um, I disagree with the – I think that the Broncos and Colts are in the same position where it's a new QB, it's a new system. Neither QB really played with the team in preseason because to preserve the health of the QB, which kind of like doesn't make really much sense because – you know, preseason is supposed to be used so that your team can really get together if it can figure themselves. But the point is that a uh, team that disappointed was the Broncos, I feel like. Uh, I could, I mean, fourth and five, and you're not, you don't put the hands in Russell Wilson. I don't really get that. Um, team that exceeded expectations, I would say it's the Seahawks. I was very impressed with them. They looked really good. Another team that kind of disappointed was the 49ers. Everyone thought that they are going to be an elite team, and they just did not come out. Now, the conditions were absolutely a slip and slide. It was like a water park out there. Um, but, I mean, th- those are my two teams. Oh, another team at this point, of course, were the Patriots. Uh, nothing to say about that. I mean, oh, yeah. That was- the Patriots. Let's, let's I'm sorry. They just played awful. They just played awful. Mac Jones did not look good. Uh, the offense is, uh, it looks completely disconfigured. Uh, the defense was just letting Tyreek Hill just run all over them. Uh, you know, I mean, also, we were playing, like, zone coverage against Tyreek Hill, and we should have been playing man-to-man um, because we would just allow him to get the ball, and he would just, you know, on a slant for five yards, and he would run after catch, would be, like, 25 yards, and you'd have these 30-yard gains. Uh, the Tua look great. No, he didn't really launch that any bombs that I was, you know, supremely impressed with. Uh, but Mac, Mac Jones did not look good. Uh, the, just the whole Patriots team did not look good. I don't get why Matt Patricia's play calling at this point. Just you know, get rid of Bill Belichick if Matt Patricia's play calling. Like I really don't understand what's the point of Bill Belichick if he's not the one who's doing the play calling. Uh, mm-hmm. I just yeah. had to say that. I'm sorry for the rant. No, it's all good. You kind of already started the next topic, which was let me out, Rafi. Let me throw out one team real quick before you move on. Oh yeah, absolutely. Because um. This is a team I was very low on. I think literally everyone was very low on them. But they really were not as atrociously bad as we thought they were. And those are the Jacksonville Jaguars. Yes, they did have um, a couple really bad drops. Really, Jacksonville um, really plays you'd expect for the Jaguars to make. Trevor missed a couple throws early. They um, Their kicker missed, I believe it was a chip shot field goal, maybe an extra point. The kickers were horrible um, last week. But they um, they looked like a new team. They looked like they had a new culture. Trevor had probably his best game as a pro. Uh, Christian Kirk balled out for me in fantasy. Maybe worth that giant contract he got. And Trayvon Walker really made some huge plays defensively. I don't think that they're going to be like the Cincinnati Bengals where they take a jump to become a, a contender right away. But I really think this could be the start of something in what is probably the weakest division in the AFC. Crazy what happens when you have a somewhat not delusional head coach. David Array gave a quick thing about how he felt that the Patriots performed. Both of us, Theodore and I, are going to talk about our teams. We'll start with me first because we know Theodore is going to take a little bit, which is perfectly fine. He can bask in this. Falcons, why? Why? (laughs) Stop. Stop it, please. They played like they were chickens. They played like cowards in the fourth quarter. They were just like, oh, like, let's play prevent. Let's make sure that the Saints don't beat us. It's like, no, put the dagger, dagger, put the dagger in their hearts. The game is over. You just need to be aggressive. And rather than doing that, they sat on their butts and did nothing. They let the Saints get back into the game. I don't, 
At this point, Mariota fumbling inside the 10 obviously costed the game. But the coaching, like, be do something. I would be fine if the Falcons lost a close game to the Saints. That's fine with me. It's the matter that they do it. It's just like, like, seriously, come on. I'm just, they played so well in the first half. The defense played so well as well. They held up so well until the final couple of drives in the game. I was really optimistic about this team not sucking, but it's clear that the Falcons are cursed. I believe in curses. The Falcons are cursed. The Chargers are cursed. I don't know. I don't know. You know what? I realize, you know what? It makes sense. I'm a huge hockey fan. I love the Blackhawks. I love hockey. You know why? Because there's only three periods. There's three. There's none of this four nonsense because we all know what happens when they're winning the four. I don't want to talk about it. Theodore, talk about the Giants now. Okay. Um, but yeah, that was a cool story. Um, but man, one and oh, this feels incredible. I've not witnessed this since I was little. I was literally in sixth grade. I was eleven years old the last time we had a winning record in a football season. Um, man, I can't believe we were so bad for so long. But we're back now, and that is all that matters. I mean, man, I can't comprehend this. Saquon Barkley is the player he was as a rookie. This was such a fresh, a breath of fresh air, seeing him go out and dominate the way he did. Um, defensively, the fact that we held Derrick Henry, like the fact that we made him look human was incredible. Uh, the secondary was atrocious. Um, that's going to be a huge problem going forward, especially when we do play teams like the Minnesota Vikings with um, Justin Jefferson. I don't know how we possibly think we're going to stop him in any way, shape, or form. But um, I'm not really scared of any team running on us, which is so refreshing. Like, next week we have the Panthers. Baker Mayfield is going to need to beat us with his arm. And that's just something that when you're playing a Baker Mayfield or a Cooper Rush or a Justin Fields, like, I'm not really scared of them. And that is why I think that the next three games could be possibly wins for the Giants. I'm not going to go totally off the rails and say that we're going 11-6, and six, which I did do in the um, podcast group chat, by the way, because we are going 11-6. and six. But um, I think a lot of the tools are here. Andrew Thomas was the third highest rated tackle by PFF this week. He was just a brick wall all game. Daniel Jones did what he had to for the most part. He threw one atrocious interception, which whatever. But um, he was 17 for 21. You know, he completed most of his passes. Our weapons really got themselves out there besides Kenny Galladay, who still is Kenny Galladay. But, um, man, so many pieces are in place. So much stuff is coming together. We're going to continue to dial up the pass rush, and I really think this could be not going to say the start of something special. I'm not going to go that far, but I think we'll be in playoff contention this year, and that's just so different from what I'm used to. My thing is, you no. look down the stretch, they have, they at some point they play the Jaguars, Seahawks, Texans, <laughs> and Lions. That's a very, very good stretch for the Giants. I worry that if the Giants have a good year this year, because their schedule sucks, that there might be too high of expectations going next year. And it might mean that you keep Daniel Jones potentially as well. So we'll see what happens. Obviously. Daniel Jones is the guy. Get it into your head. No. No. Moving on. Moving on to some stuff that Theor is not is more human with. He's not a god. We're going to talk a little bit about college football. First off, Notre Dame. What's up, buds? You guys like being uh, overrated? Because uh, you know what? It's, it's good. It's good. They don't need to worry about getting blown out this year in the college football playoff. It's they're just doing their dues before. They don't want to get blown out by the, so they're just gonna get blown out by Marshall. Completely get it. Hey, they're playing some three D chess right there. Notre Dame in the week three AP poll is not in the top twenty five. In fact, they are thirty six. You'll love to see it. Theodore, I don't know what you were on about Notre Dame earlier. They suck. You can all admit this. I am so happy that I don't need to think about Notre Dame even coming close to the college football playoff this year. Man, Brian Kelly really destroyed the program by leaving. I overestimated Who would have guessed Kelly. that? Who would have guessed Brian Kelly of all people? That's like Urban Meyer leaving, and you're like, we got worse. Like, but. Right. Like, I really just, I don't know. I didn't expect there to be this much of a fall-off just because of a coaching change. Because um, I don't think Tyler Buckner is really the problem. 
I think he is not like elite, but I think he's a QB you can win with. I don't he, know. He he did some good work versus Ohio State with his legs. I will give him that. But first Marshall, he looked yeah. Bad. The but how much of that is on him versus play calling? You can make you can make the argument, yeah. Or you can just make the argument that they're overrated and they suck, which I'm like, definitely going to go with. But they just, see, the thing is, right. their defense is pretty solid. We saw that versus Ohio mm-hmm. State, how they held up. The defense is overall pretty solid for the most part. But it's like it's like Iowa, another team that Dior loves for some reason, where it's okay. you have that a, one I can't defend. You have a great defense, you have a solid defense, but your offense. Iowa scored a touchdown last week. Good work. They only scored seven points again. They lost to Iowa State ten to seven. They played so well def- defensively. I don't know. Once again, I also just want to pat myself on the back. I did also mention in the in the group me that in the group chat that I had App State beating Texas A and M at ten thirty six in the morning Saturday morning, and I was right. App State pulled off the upset for Texas A and M in a great game, very low scoring, but once again shows that Texas A and M was also rated. Just want to pump my tires a little bit before we get into what was definitely a colder take on my end, which was shocking for college football. Mm-hmm. I really, really went on a tangent last week saying that oh Texas is gonna get blown out, oh Texas this horns down, da 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 da. And although the horns are still down, I will not lie, I was a bit nervous about how dumb I I may have looked if that if Quinn Ewers and if ah shoot what's his name if uh, Texas. So his other backup quarterback didn't get dinged up during the game because you can make the argument. Obviously, it was a uh, card, Hudson card. Yes, Hudson card. You can make the argument, though, after the first few drives that Texas really could have won that game because Alabama, this was the most penalties that they tied in a single game. Theodore, you were the person who didn't give up on Texas. I want to hear your thoughts on that game. I think this is a turning point in Texas football. Yes, I know they said the same thing after the 2019 Sugar Bowl or Cotton Bowl. I don't remember which one. That's it. Hey, Longhorn Nation, we're back. Yes, um, obviously they were not back as we now know. But seriously, look, this is a program on the rise. There's no way around it. And for the past couple, or I say couple, for the past like half decade, they've been losing a lot of homegrown recruits due to the fact that they'd go to Texas A&M to be a part of the SEC. But guess what? If Texas is also in the SEC, which school are these recruits going to want to go to? Quite frankly, if I was a recruit, I'd want to go to Texas, the flagship uh, place, the one that, you know, everyone in my state talks about nonstop as being the school in our state. I just feel like Texas is going to be pulling in so many recruits once they turn over and this is just the best possible, you know, boot of confidence that they can put in their um, program for potential recruits. It'll stop guys from transferring away this year. It'll get guys to transfer in next year. And Quinn Ewers just looked absurd. Like the throws that he, that one throw um, down feet, I forget the receiver's name that he gave it to, but it was just an absolute dime. He was on point. Don't know what the injury situation is. I think he'll be back soon. And the next year, I legitimately think that Texas could be a college football playoff contender. They definitely, you can definitely make the argument that of that next year when they're still in the Big 12. Because exactly, I don't think there's any team in the Big 12 that's really solid enough where or has a quarterback play where it's like, okay, like this team could be really high end. And obviously, once again. Quinn Ewers is missing, I believe, four to six weeks with an injury. So we'll see what happens over the next few weeks, how he recovers and how he plays afterwards. We're really jumping gun, but for the first time in a while, and I am an, I hate Notre Dame. I will never give, I will rarely give them anything. Texas, I don't like. I will keep doing horns down. But I, I do have to give my props to them. They really impressed me week one. And I think that, I don't think that they're going to be in a top 10 spot this upcoming year. But next year, again, as you alluded to, Big 12 is not going to be. Oklahoma is going to take a step back. I think mm-hmm. they're ranked number That's... six. Now. They're ranked number six. I don't think they finish six. I think they finish closer yeah. to 50 than mm-hmm. inside the top 10. Mm-hmm. We'll obviously see what, ha- see what happens because the college football season is so long. And there's obviously so much chaos that can occur, which is why I love college football. But 
it, it definitely looks like Texas is trajectory is on its way up for the first time we've seen in a while. Steve Sarkeesian, Armenian, gotta love him. So at the end of the day, I do have to root for another fellow Armenian doing good things in the world. Davian, before we close, I'd like to hear two words out of your mouth. Roll Tide. There we go. And with that, we, that concludes this edition of the Ben Coomersburg Podcast. We hope you enjoyed. We are a few weeks out from hockey and basketball starting up, so we're excited about that. It'll give us some more stuff to talk, talk and discuss. Theodore and Davian have been doing their hockey homework as I've been giving them for NHL 101. Very excited for what's to come this upcoming season. If you want to watch some shorter stuff on TikTok, be sure to follow us, Ben Trumer underscore sports. We're getting back into the rhythm. Davian's going to be cranking out some fantasy content. I'll be getting some hockey stuff out. Off you off. Steve is going to be sharing all of his other awesome and ridiculous takes over the next few weeks. So you're definitely going to want to watch some of those one, two minute clips as well. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Also, not yet, but give it a few weeks. But I will be posting some, probably some NHL reaction videos or just some hockey videos as well up on the YouTube. So you guys are definitely going to want to. Check out those as well. But for Theodore, for Davian, I'm Rob Sarafi. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Ventral Sports Podcast and have a great rest of your night. Peace.